hello once again. I uh, want to welcome all of you to this meeting this afternoon. Thanks for sticking around. We are presently in a series on Christian standards. And of course, that is a broad category uh, because we are dealing not only with what we watch and what we see and what we hear. You know, we need to understand that behind the sta standards, we have principles. And so whenever we have a standard, we need to look for the principle that stands behind the standard. So uh, this afternoon, we are going to study about uh, strange fire. And you're probably wondering, what is that strange fire that we're going to talk about? Well, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get right into our study. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you for the good meal that we've been able to enjoy. Thank you for Christian fellowship where we can gather together to share with one another, to strengthen one another's faith through fellowship. We thank you for your word, a sure guide in a world that is so confused, and we ask that that word will speak to us today, that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The prophet Daniel was 18 year, years old when he arrived in Babylon for the captivity. And by the way, he was still there when the captivity ended in the year 536. Now Daniel was taken from his land when he was 18. His parents were not with him. The priests were not with him. Probably his friends and siblings, if he had any, were not with him. He was basically uprooted from his land and taken to a strange land with a strange language, a strange culture, a strange religion, a strange educational system. In fact, when the book of Daniel begins, it begins by telling us that there is a controversy. There's a controversy between two kings, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It's a controversy between two gods, Yahweh and the god of the Babylonians, Marduk. It's a controversy between two cities, Babylon and Jerusalem. It's a controversy between the temple of God and the temple of Nebuchadnezzar's God. It's a controversy between two people, between the Hebrews and the Babylonians. Let's read about this in Daniel chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 where you find these contrasts that I just mentioned. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. So in this way, the book of Daniel is introduced. The book that describes a period of time from 605 all the way down to the year 536 at the end of the captivity. Now, when Daniel arrives in Babylon, it appears that Nebuchadnezzar has the upper hand in the whole situation. His God appears to be more powerful than the Hebrew God, because if the Hebrew God was more powerful, why would Daniel be in captivity? Obviously, to the naked eye, it seemed like Nebuchadnezzar and his God and his city and his people were more powerful than Daniel and his God and his people. And so Nebuchadnezzar decides that he is going to flex his muscles and he's going to show that his power is absolute, that he dictates everything that the Hebrews are going to do upon their arrival in Babylon. But if you noticed something very interesting in these two verses that I began with, 
we are told that Nebuchadnezzar was not in control because at the beginning of verse 2 that we just read it says, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim king of Judah into his hand. So on the surface it might appear that Nebuchadnezzar was the powerful being that was able to take these young men captive, but the Bible tells us that God allowed this to happen for a very special purpose. And you would never know the purpose when they arrived in Babylon, but you certainly would know the purpose when you get to the end of the book. Now how did Nebuchadnezzar attempt to show his power and his clout? Daniel 1 verse 5 tells us that when Daniel and his friends arrived in Babylon, the king appointed their diet. In other words, the king said, this is what you're going to eat and this is what you're going to drink. Now uh, let's read about that in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 5. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. So for a period, according to this, of three years, Daniel and his friends are going to eat the best food, in quotation marks, in Babylon, and the choicest wine of Babylon. But Nebuchadnezzar did not have absolute control. He appointed the diet, but Daniel and his friends refused to partake of the wine and of the food. Which clearly shows that Nebuchadnezzar was not in absolute control, he had some resistance. Incidentally, there were also other Hebrew young men there, because Daniel tells us that many of the Hebrew nobility were taken there. What happened with the other individuals, with the other young men? Well, the Bible tells us that there were four who remained faithful. The others must have given in to the peer pressure and must have said, thank you King Nebuchadnezzar for giving us your best food and for giving us your best wine to drink. The Bible tells us that Daniel and his friends refused to eat of the king's food and to drink of the king's wine. Let's read about it in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart. Notice, decisions are made first in your mind or your heart, and then they're carried out in action. In other words, the decision has to be made before you actually abide by the decision. So Daniel and his friends had made their decision that even though they were in a strange land with a strange God, a despotic king, that they were going to abide by God's principles and by God's standards. So it says Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies nor with the wine which he drank. So Daniel says I'm going to contest the king's diet and I'm going to contest the king's drink. Now let me ask you, was this a small test that they had to pass? Yeah, it was small. I mean, was their life in danger? No. The life of the cook might be in danger, but not the lives of Daniel and his friends. It was a small test. It wasn't like the test before the image of Nebuchadnezzar. It wasn't like Daniel uh, having the threat of being thrown in the lion's den. Those would be big tests because their lives were in danger. But this was a small test. It was a test concerning diet. Now let me read you a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. It's found in the book Fundamentals of Christian Education, pages 80 and 81. What if Daniel and his companions had made a compromise with those heathen officers and had yielded to the pressure of the occasion, that's called peer pressure by the way, by eating and drinking as was customary with the Babylonians? Now listen to this, that single instance of departure from principle, remember we're talking about principles, see the issue of diet is a standard that is based on a principle, 
that is that our body and our mind belong to God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that's the principle. And it's manifested in what we eat and in what we drink. So she says that single instance of departure from principle would have weakened their sense of right and their abhorrence of wrong. Indulgence of appetite would have, been in, would have involved the sacrifice of physical vigor, clearness of intellect, and spiritual power. One wrong step would probably have led to others until their connection with heaven being severed, they would have been swept away by temptation. That's quite a statement. The single instance, she says, of departure, one wrong step would lead to others. But these were young men whose standards were based on divine principles. They would not give in even in the smallest matters, the matter of diet. Now the king also tried to show his clout and his power by changing their names. Notice Daniel chapter 1 and verse 7. It says there, to them the chief of eunuchs, and we're going to see that it's because of the order of the king, the king actually determined their names, to them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. By the way, the Hebrew names are names in honor of God. You know, Daniel means God is my judge. And Hananiah, you know, Yah means Yahweh. That's uh, the ending of his name. Uh, Shadrach, uh, uh, Mishael, El means God. Azariah, once again, it ends in Yah, which is the name for Yahweh. In other words, their names were in honor of the God of the Hebrews. But the king says, I need to change their names. Now, why would the king think it important to change their names? Because in the Bible, a name is an indication of the character. Now, if they kept their Hebrew names and they always referred to themselves by their Hebrew names, they would always be remembering that they were servants of the God of the Hebrews. So it was necessary to change their names so that as their names were called and repeated, it would sink in and it would change their way of thinking. In fact, notice Daniel chapter 5 and verse 12. The names were actually given by the king. The eunuch simply did what the king told him. It says in Daniel chapter 5 and verse 12, Inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. We just read a moment ago that it was the eunuch who named him Belteshazzar. Now it says the king. So who was it that ordered to give them these names? It was King Nebuchadnezzar. So it says now let Daniel be called and he, he will give the interpretation. And by the way, the Babylonian names were names in honor of the Babylonian gods. You say, how do we know that? Well, notice Daniel chapter 4 and verse 8, the name Belteshazzar. It says in Daniel 4 verse 8, now uh, you know Daniel comes before the king because he's had this dream of the tree that is cut down but the stump remains, which refers to himself. It says there in Daniel 4 verse 8, but at last Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar according to the name of my God. So the names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were names in honor of the Babylonian gods, Belteshazzar as well. What the king wanted was that by hearing their names, they would come to the realization that the gods of Babylon were the gods to be followed. But you know what's interesting? If you read the rest of the book of Daniel, every time that God refers to the three young men, he uses their three, Hebrew, their, their three young men and Daniel, he uses their Hebrew names. And every time that Daniel and his friends refer to themselves, they use their Hebrew names. So in other words, they're saying, nice try, King Nebuchadnezzar, but we will use our Hebrew names. Your power is limited. 
The king also tried to show his power over these young men by changing their way of thinking through the Babylonian educational system. You see, they immediately are placed in the University of Babylon. It says in the book of Daniel that the purpose is to teach them the letters and the philosophy and the way of thinking of the Babylonians. So they're registered in the PhD program of the University of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar by doing this wanted to change their worldview. He wanted to change their way of thinking. But once again when we read the book of Daniel we see very clearly that they weren't buying. You say how do we know that? Well, first of all, we know that all of the other wise men hated them. <laughs> you know, if they fit in real well, if they uh, were politically correct and said, let's go along with the Babylonian educational system, they wouldn't have been hated. They would have been liked. But obviously they were hated because they did not go along with the methods of the Babylonians. And there's a second point which is very important, and that is that nowhere in the book do we find Daniel and his friends using the divination methods that were used by the wise men of Babylon. You remember the story of Daniel too, right? The king has this dream, and in the dream he sees this big uh, image, and when he wakes up he's forgotten the dream. What does the king do? He says, well, let's call the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the, the, the magicians, let's call all of the theologians of Babylon so that they can tell me what my dream was and what the dream means. Were they able to do it? No, they're using Babylonian methods, right? So finally, eventually, um, King Nebuchadnezzar says, uh, somebody says to Nebuchadnezzar, well, you know, there's, there's a, an individual who is, is an expert at interpreting dreams, uh, which would be Daniel. And so Daniel comes and says, King, you know, how come you're so, so much in a hurry to kill all the wise men of Babylon because they can't tell you the dream? He says, uh, let me go and, and take a look in my crystal ball. Let, 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 let night time come so I can, I can read the stars. Oh king, give me the palm of your hand so that I can read the destiny in the palm of your hand. No, that's not what Daniel said. What did Daniel say? Daniel said, give me time. I'll go pray to my God. And they had, a, they had a, 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 the prayer warriors get together, Daniel and his three friends. And they prayed to God for wisdom in telling the king his dream and the interpretation of the dream. They did not use the same methods that the Babylonians used, which means that they were not buying into the educational system of Babylon. So even though Nebuchadnezzar is doing his utmost to show his absolute power, the three young men along with Daniel are saying, we are not accepting your absolute authority. We will not eat your food or drink your wine. We will not use the Babylonian names that you have given us, and we will not use the methods that are taught in the University of Babylon. Did these young men live according to principle? You better believe they did. And the standards of their lives, the practices of their lives, were absolutely in harmony with God's principles to a T, to absolute perfection. What was the result? In Daniel chapter 1 and verse 17, we find the result of their faithfulness. It says, as for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And you know the story, when they were brought before the king, they were ten times better in everything. It says their faces were, were rosier and, and of more flesh than the other wise men of Babylon. You know, sometimes we think, that in order to be a vegan, you have to look like a skeleton. Well, that's not the case, because it says that they, that, that, that they were rosier. They look, you know, they, 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 they looked fuller. They, they weren't obese, but they looked healthy. They looked healthy. They were ten times better, not only in their looks, but also in their wisdom and knowledge, because they chose to be faithful to God's principles and follow God's standards. Now what I want us to do is to go to the big trials that they had. You see, these original trials, you know, they, they were not such great trials, particularly relating to diet. Their life was not in danger. If they, if they were sickly, well, you know, Nebuchadnezzar would get after the cook, not after them. But then came the big trials. The trial in Daniel chapter 3. 
Now in Daniel chapter 3, we have a very interesting story. And I'm just basically going to tell you the story now. And um, you can read the verses in your Bibles. In Daniel chapter 3, we have a very important word that appears only in three chapters of the book of Daniel. It is the word deliver. It appears only in Daniel 3, in Daniel 6, and in Daniel 12, verse 1. In Daniel 3 and Daniel 6, it refers to past events. In Daniel 12, verse 1, it refers to events that are still in the future. Now, I want us to notice Daniel chapter 3, and first of all, verse 8. It says there that Nebuchadnezzar decided to build an image. And the reason why he built that image is because he had the dream in Daniel chapter 2 of the image. So Nebuchadnezzar says, well, you know, I'm going to do a replica of that image so that people can admire the head of gold. But, uh, you know, the, the wise men told him that. And Nebuchadnezzar said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to make an image like the one that we saw in Daniel chapter 2 with the head of gold. He said, I'm going to make the image totally of gold to show that the kingdom of Babylon is going to be an eternal kingdom. And so the king does this by instigation of the Chaldeans, by the religious leaders. In other words, you have religion trying to dictate to the state what the state should do. Now the key controversy in Daniel chapter 3 is over the law and worship. You say, why the law? Is there a second commandment that says, thou shalt not make any graven image and thou shalt not bow down to the graven image? Absolutely. Is there a commandment that says, you shall have no other gods before me? Yes. Is there a commandment that says that there's only one true creator God? Absolutely. And so in this story, we find that the controversy has to do with God's law, but it also has to do with worship. In fact, in Daniel chapter 3, the word worship is used 12 times. One for each of the 12 apostles. I'm just kidding. So the issue is the law and God's and worship to God. So the king raises up this gigantic image which is a 90 by 9, 90 feet by 9, and uh, he puts it up and he gets all of the dignitaries and the luminaries of the kingdom uh, and invites them to the dedication of the image. The instruments play. When the instruments play, there are three young men that remain standing. They don't bow. And so we're told in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 13, that the king was filled with rage because the young men did not bow before the image. Let me ask you, were these young men faithful to principle? Yes. Would they have been faithful in this big test if they had not been faithful in the smaller test when they arrived in Babylon? No. You see, it's in the small tests of lives, of our lives, in the small things of our daily routine that we determine the decisions that we will make when crunch time comes. And so the king is enraged, according to verse 13. And so the king, and this is in verse 15, so the king has the three young men brought before him. And he says to them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, is it true that you are not worshiping the image that I raised up? And they said, yes, that is true, O king. And Nebuchadnezzar says, listen, I'm going to give you another chance. At the sounding of the musical instruments, once you hear them, if you bow, fine. But if you don't, now notice the question. Who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? That's the key word. First time that the key word appears in Daniel chapter 3. Which God will deliver you from my hands? That is a direct uh, challenge to the God of the Hebrews. The three young men, 
you know, they, they are serene, they're calm. So they look at the king and they say, Oh king, we don't have any need to answer you concerning this. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. Is able to what? Ah, there's the key word again. Is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace and from your hand he will deliver us. So I think that the theme in Daniel chapter 3 is deliverance. You think? Worship in the law, yes, but those who are faithful to God will be what? Will be delivered. And so uh, they say, but if God doesn't deliver us, if God chooses not to deliver us, we still serve the true God. We still will not worship the image, we still will not worship the gods of Babylon. Our minds are made up. But they had already made up their minds in chapter 1, hadn't they? They purposed in their hearts that they were not going to eat the king's food or drink the king's wine. The small test prepared them for the bigger test. And so now, verse 19 tells us that the king, actually verse 18 and verse 19, the king says, heat that furnace seven times hotter than ever before. Now I don't think he had a thermometer. The number seven in the Bible represents fullness. In other words, he heated the furnace so hot that you couldn't get any hotter than that. In other words, to the maximum he heated the furnace. And he says, I'll show them who is the most powerful around here. I'll show them that my God is more powerful than their God. So he heats the furnace seven times hotter, and verse 19 tells us that the face of Nebuchadnezzar changed concerning the three young men. Ellen White has a very interesting statement about this moment. She says that the face of Nebuchadnezzar was disfigured and it looked like the face of a demon. She's basing her comments on this verse where the countenance of the king changed concerning the three young men. And so, you know the story, the very strong men, soldiers, took the three young men and threw them into the fiery furnace. So now Nebuchadnezzar says to himself, mission accomplished. And then he looks into the furnace, and you know this story. You've known, if you've grown up in the Adventist church, you've known this since you were in Sabbath school. This was one of the most exciting stories that I, I love to hear uh, in Sabbath school, and also I love to read in, uh, you know, the Bible stories. And so now they're, they're in the furnace. Nebuchadnezzar looks in the furnace, and he says to his assistants, he says, now wait a minute, did we not cast three men into the furnace? Yes, O king, it was three that were cast in. Nebuchadnezzar says, why then do I see four men in the furnace walking around serenely and the fourth looks like the Son of God? Wow. And some people say, some versions translate, the fourth is like the son of the gods because Nebuchadnezzar was a polytheist. He believed in multiple gods, so many Bible versions translate that Nebuchadnezzar was saying, oh, the fourth is like the son of the gods. Ellen White begs to differ. And some other versions, modern versions, also realize that this is a reference to Jesus, the son of God. Um, Ellen White makes the remark that the reason why Nebuchadnezzar knew what the, what the Son of God looked like is because Daniel and his friends had described to Nebuchadnezzar what the angel of the Lord looked like. Because in the Old Testament, Jesus is the angel of the Lord. So they had described, according to the spirit of prophecy, what uh, the angel of the Lord looked like. And you say, now wait a minute, it was the Son of God, it wasn't the angel of the Lord. Now here comes a very interesting detail that I want you to notice. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 25. Don't miss this point because we're going to come back to it again. Daniel 3 verse 25. Here Nebuchadnezzar speaks about the deliverance of the three young men. And what does Nebuchadnezzar say? He says, God sent his what? Are you, looking, are you reading that verse, verse 25? God sent his what? His angel. 
his angel, and delivered his servants who trusted in him. Now we've got an issue here. Nebuchadnezzar just said in verse 25, the fourth looks like what? The Son of God. Now the same Nebuchadnezzar in verse 28 is saying that the individual who delivered the three young men from the furnace was what? The angel. Once again the word deliver. Now you say, is there, is there a contradiction here? There is no contradiction. Because we're going to see in a few moments that that name of that angel that delivered the three young men from the furnace is Michael the archangel. Are you with me? And so then the king, if you go all the way to verse 29, the king says, there is no God who can deliver like this one. So what is the central theme of Daniel 3? Deliverance. So if you're faithful to God, what's going to happen? If you're faithful to God, you're going to be delivered. You know, there are some Adventists where I travel, they say, oh, Pastor Boer, that time of trouble is going to be really terrible. You know, being persecuted and not, and you know, uh, not starving to death, but being hungry and in prison and under a death decree. I hope the Lord lays me to rest before then. Well, that's kind of selfish. What we need to do is say to the Lord, Lord, if you want me to go through that period, give me the stamina and the strength to be faithful to you and to give a good witness about you. Keep me faithful, Lord, and to prepare for that trial. That's really what we should be doing, not to escape the trials, but to receive strength to go through the trials. So the central theme of Daniel 3 is deliverance. If you are on God's side, God is on your side. Don't be afraid of the time of trouble because the angel, the Son of God, will come to deliver you. Now there's another story that takes place, and this has to do not with the three young men, but with Daniel. And it's not happening during the period of the kingdom of Babylon. It's taking place during the kingdom of Medo-Persia. In fact, uh, you know, uh, Daniel was very, very old at this time. So it shows that Daniel and his friends were not only faithful when they were young, they were also faithful when they were old. So let's go to Daniel chapter 6, and let's take a look at this parallel story where once again the word deliver is central. What is the controversy about in Daniel chapter 6? Well, if you read verses 4 and 5, the enemies of Daniel who hated him could find nothing that Daniel was doing that was dishonest. He was perfectly honest and efficient in working for the king. They couldn't find any defect in his administrative work. So they said, the only thing that we're going to be able to do to get this Daniel is concerning the law of his God. So once again, the controversy has to do with what? has to do with God's law. And by the way, it has to do with worship as well, because later on in the story, we find Daniel kneeling before his God three times a day. So once again, the issue is the law of God and worship. And so these individuals prepare a plot. They go before the king, and this is, by the way, if you're not writing down the verses, verses 6 through 9, uh, the king uh, they go before the king and they say to, to King Darius, oh king, we love you so much. I'm kind of paraphrasing and putting a few words in, but this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to butter up the king. They're deceiving him. He doesn't realize that they really want to get rid of Daniel. They think, he thinks that it's because they love him. Oh king, we love you so much. Why don't you give a decree that for 30 days no one can make a petition of a man or a god except you? And the king says, oh wow, these guys really like me, don't they? What he doesn't realize is they're plotting to get rid of Daniel. And so the king, you know, he exercises his absolute power and he makes this decree that no one can call upon, uh, make a request of a god or a man for a period of 30 days. He says, now I've exercised my power. But listen carefully now. His power is limited because he exercises his power to enact the law, but then he becomes a slave of his own law. His power is not absolute. His power is limited. Because then he is bound by his own law, 
because the law of the Medes and Persians could not be changed. So he exercises his power in enacting the law, but then he becomes a slave of his own law. So Daniel hears about this decree. This is verse 10. And Daniel goes to his room. He says, no, read to, no reason to make these men angry. I'll just close the windows. Is that what Daniel did? No. Daniel says, I serve the true God. I need to witness to the true God. And so he opens the windows and he prays three times a day as he customarily did. It says there in Daniel 6 and verse 10. Verse 11 tells us that the spies are close by and they're seeing Daniel kneeling and making a petition of his God. And so now in verses 12 and 13, they go to complain before the king. They say, O king, there is an individual who has violated your law, your decree. And the king says, oh yeah, who? Daniel. By the way, the king loved Daniel. Throughout the whole story, you can tell that the king really loved Daniel. And now the king says, oh no, now I know what these guys wanted, but it's too late. I'm bound by my own law. I use my authority to enact the law, and now I'm bound by my own law. So the Bible tells us in Daniel 6 and verse 14, that the king did everything in his power to deliver Daniel. See, there's the word deliver. First time in chapter 6. He used all of his power, all of his knowledge, to try and find a way to deliver Daniel, but he couldn't. And so, in verse 16, Daniel is brought to the mouth of the lion's den, and the king looks at Daniel, he says, Oh, Daniel, I'm really sorry about this. I can't deliver you. May the God that you occasionally serve, <laughs> may the God that you what? Continually serve, deliver you from the lion's den. He's saying, may he deliver you because I can't. His power is limited. He realizes that the God of Daniel might be more powerful than he is. So once again, the word deliver. He wants to deliver Daniel, and he says to Daniel, may your God, whom you continually serve, deliver you from the mouths of the lions. And so the king goes to bed that night, can't sleep, insomnia. You know, there were the, probably no sleeping pills back then. He didn't call the musicians. He didn't have his regular banquet of, of food. All night, he was concerned about Daniel in the lion's den. And there was Daniel in the lion's den petting the lions, just like they were kitty cats. I don't know if he did that. <laughs> that might be a little presumptuous. But anyway, he spent all night there in the lion's den. And so the king now comes early in the morning, as early as he can. And he goes to the mouth of the lion's den. He says, Daniel! silence for a moment. Daniel, has the God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lion's den? And Daniel says, my God whom I serve has been able to deliver me from the lion's den. Amen. What is the theme of chapter 6? Deliverance, folks, deliverance. And then verse 23 says that Daniel was delivered because he believed in his God. Amen. By the way, that word believe is uh, greatly abused these days. People think that believe means something believing up here in your head. Like, I believe you're here this afternoon. You know, or, or, or I, I believe, you know, just intellectually things. That's not what the word believe means. Both in the Old and New Testament, the word believe means to trust. It means to have faith in someone, not something, someone. And so they were, Daniel was delivered because he believed or trusted in his God. And then in verse 27, in verse 27, now the king gives a proclamation. He says, everyone in my kingdom must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, because there is no God who can deliver such as this God. 
So are we to fear the time of trouble that is about to come, the furnace of fire and the lion's den? Absolutely not. By the way, this story, these two stories actually, are really a foreshadowing of the crisis that God's people will go through at the end of time. We are now going through rehearsal for that time. If we are not living in harmony with God's principles now, with God's standards now, if we're not willing to give up things like jewelry and we're not, we're not able to live in harmony with God's health principles and if we're not faithful in the way that we handle our money, if we're not faithful in, in all of these different things, these, these standards, we're not going to be faithful in the great trials ahead because Jesus said he who is faithful in little will be faithful in much. And he who is unfaithful in little will be unfaithful in much. It's now that we learn to be faithful in the small things which will lead us to prepare a character to pass the big tests that are going to come in the future. So we must be faithful now. These two stories are actually fulfilled at the end of time. The last time that the word deliver is used in Daniel is in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. But I need to give you a little bit of context about what comes before this. In chapter 11, towards the end of the chapter, and there's a lot of controversy these days about the Daniel chapter 11, the king of the north, the king of the south, I have no doubts whatsoever that the king of the north at the end of Daniel chapter 11 represents the papacy. It represents the same as the little horn, it represents the same as the beast, it represents the same as the man of sin, it represents the same as the abomination of desolation, it represents the same as the harlot, it represents the same as the antichrist, all are different names for the same system. And so the last part of Daniel 11 tells us that the king of the north will go out with great rage and fury to destroy and annihilate many. In other words, this system, when its wound is healed, is going to go out to attempt to destroy God's people. And when it appears that they're going to be wiped out, just like the three young men who were thrown into the furnace, and Daniel who was thrown into the lion's den, Daniel 12 verse 1 says, Michael shall stand up. That's the close of probation, by the way. Don't have time to get into that. But the standing up of Michael means that probation now closes. All cases are decided for life or for death. And then after probation closes, we are told Michael shall stand up, that great prince who stands watch over the children of your people. See, he's the same individual who delivered the three young men from the furnace. And by the way, who delivered Daniel from the lion's den? The angel delivered Daniel from the lion's den. The same angel, see? That's the connection. The angel in Daniel 3, the angel in Daniel 6, and Michael the archangel in chapter 12 and verse 1. But God's people are not going to be delivered from the time of trouble. In other words, they're, not, they're going to go through the time of trouble. Just like Daniel went into the lion's den, yes. And the three young men went through the fire furnace experience. In fact, you know that in great controversy in the chapter, the time of trouble, Ellen White, when she describes God's faithful remnant going through the final time of trouble, she says, the flames of the furnace appear at the point of consuming them, but they will come forth as pure gold. In other words, the fiery furnace in Daniel chapter 3 represents spiritually, symbolically, the fiery trials in the time of trouble that God's people will go through at the end of time, during the time of trouble. But now notice what it says. Michael shall stand up. Now, what does the name Michael mean? The name Michael comes from three Hebrew words. It's a combination of three Hebrew words. Mi, which means who. Ka, like. El, God. So basically the name Michael means who is like God. It's actually a challenge. And every time that Michael appears in scripture, he's always fighting with the devil. And he always wins. And when he wins, God's people win with him. Amen. Every single time. And there's only five times that the name Michael is used in Scripture. 
in Daniel chapter 10, and uh, also in uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, it's used also in uh, the book of Jude, verse 9. It's used in Revelation chapter 12, etc. Five times the name is used. And the name means who is like God. I want you to remember that because that's an important detail for what we're going to notice next. Now, Daniel 12, verse 1 says that when the king of the north goes out to destroy and annihilate God's people, Michael will stand up, probation will close because all decisions have been made. And then it says that there will be a time of trouble such there never was in the history of the world. But then the good news is your people shall be what? Delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. So what is the central theme of, the, of Bible prophecy in the end time? It's not the crisis. Michael stands up to stand watch over his people in the time of trouble. You know, there many Seventh-day Adventists say, oh, you know, uh, you know, Jesus is going to uh, change his robes from his priestly robes to his uh, kingly robes, and he's going to leave, and we're going to be here on our own. Well, let me tell you, we're not going to have an intercessor because Jesus will take off his priestly robes. He will no longer be interceding for sinners, so we must have obtain the victory over sin, but he doesn't mean that he's going to leave. He is going to be here not as an intercessor, but as a protector of his people. When God's people go through the furnace, he will be with them in the furnace. When God's people go through, so to speak, the lion's den, Jesus will be with his people, so we need to ally ourselves with Jesus, and then we have nothing to fear. Ellen White once said, we have nothing to fear of the future unless we forget how God has led us when? In the past. Now I want us to go to Revelation chapter 13 and verses 3 and 4. This has a connection with Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. The Bible speaks of the beast, which represents the papacy, the, the papacy ruled for how long in the past? It ruled for 1,260 years, from 538 to 1798. What happened in 1798? The papacy received a what? A deadly wound. With what weapon? With the sword. The sword is what the civil power has. So the papacy used the sword to destroy God's people during the 1260 years, 1798, France took away the sword and gave the papacy its deadly wound. But Revelation chapter 13 tells us that after a certain period, the deadly wound is going to be what? Is going to be healed. And the beast is going to behave in the future the same way that it behaved in the past. It will recover the sword of civil power. And it will be able to use the power of the state the power of the sword to persecute those who are not in harmony with it. Its deadly wound is going to be healed. And it's going to behave in the same way that it behaved in the past. How many people are going to follow the beast? The Bible says the whole world worshiped and followed the beast. Now, you need to take that word whole with a grain of salt because it's not all of the whole because there is going to be a faithful remnant just like there was in Daniel 3, just like there was in Daniel chapter 6. There's going to be a group of people that say, we will not worship the beast, we will not worship the image, we will not receive the mark. God is going to have a faithful people, a people of principle a people who live according to God's standards. If we're not living by God's principles and standards now, in times of relative peace, when things are calm, what makes us think that all of a sudden, when the big tests come, we're going to say, okay, emergency, I'll turn on the principles and the standards now. It's not going to happen that way. Now what's going to happen when the whole world is wondering after this system, with the exception of this small remnant? I want you to notice Revelation chapter uh, 13 
and verses 3 and 4. Chapter 13 and verse 3 describes the healing of the deadly wound. And then verse 4 tells us that the people are going to be asking a question. Those who follow the beast and worship the beast are going to launch a question. Now what does the name Michael mean? Who is like God? But what are the multitudes who follow the beast going to say? They're going to say, who is like the beast? And Jesus is going to step forward and he says, who is like God? So the final battle is between two individuals. Who is like the beast and who is like God? Who is going to win? God ultimately will prevail. And his people who have lived by principle will prevail with him. Do you remember Psalm 34 and verse 7? You know, I've read that verse many, many times, and I, I, I've missed the point. It says, the angel of the Lord does what? And camps around those who fear him. Who fear whom? The angel of the Lord. Are you with me? The angel of the Lord and camps around those who fear him and defends them. So what is the key? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if you don't fear the Lord, you don't even have the beginning of wisdom. So whoever doesn't fear the Lord is a fool because they don't have any wisdom whatsoever. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now you say, Pastor Boy, I've never heard uh, Psalm 34 verse 7 interpreted in that fashion. You know that the, 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 the angel of the Lord there is Jesus Christ? Yes, it is. You remember the burning, the burning bush episode? It says the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses. And the bush was burning, but it wasn't consumed. And then, in the same context, it says that the Lord spoke to Moses from the bush. Yahweh spoke to Moses from the bush. Then it says, God spoke to him from the bush. Who was the angel of the Lord? It was God. Which person of the Godhead? Jesus Christ. You say, how do we know that? Because later on in chapter 3, we find Moses asking the asking God, Yahweh, the angel of the Lord in the bush, when I go to the people, the people are going to ask me, in what name am I, is this person going to deliver us? What name should I tell them? What was the name that was given? Tell them that I am has sent me to you. Who was that I am? All you have to do is go to the New Testament. To John chapter 8, verses 58 and 59, where Jesus spoke some words that really shook up the religious leaders. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. And the Jews understood very well what Jesus was saying because they picked up stones to stone him because they were accusing him of blasphemy because he has claimed the name I am, which belonged to Yahweh, he had claimed it as his own. So the angel of the Lord is Michael the archangel. It's Jesus. That's the reason why in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. So the Lord is the archangel. Jesus, in other words, will be the deliverer of his people. And by the way, I don't want you to get the wrong impression, and those who are watching this program, you know, Jesus is not a created angel. The word angel means messenger. Jesus was the Father's special messenger in the Old Testament, as well as after his incarnation in the New Testament, and he still is the messenger of the Father. But Jesus is called Michael. Jesus is God. He's 100% God, just like the Father is 100% God. That's something that is crucially important because if Jesus isn't God, 
we might as well pack up and go home because he can't save us. One who is less than God cannot save us. So Jesus is not an ordinary created angel. The angels, angelic hosts, are created angels. Jesus is called Michael the archangel, but he is eternal God. Michael is a title or a name that he has. Are you with me? So are we to fear what's going to happen at the end of time? Absolutely not. Now write down one more verse. Exodus 23 and verse 20. Very interesting verse. It says there, it's speaking about the angel of the Lord that is going to guide Israel out of Egypt across the desert or across the wilderness into the promised land. And the person who is speaking, who is God the Father, says to Israel, don't rebel against him because he will not forgive you because my name is in him. That's what God the Father is saying. My name is in him. What is the name of God the Father? Yahweh or Jehovah. That's the reason why Ellen White has said that Jehovah is the name that has been given to Christ. There's this, this big debate. Who is Jehovah? Is it the Father, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes. <laughs> all three are called Yahweh in Scripture because all three are fully and completely God. I end with this quotation. Four Testimonies 573 and 574. Men of principle need not the restrictions of locks and keys. They do not need to be watched and guarded. They will deal truly and honorably at all times, alone with no eye upon them as well as in public. They will not bring a stain upon their souls for any amount of gain or selfish advantage. They scorn a mean act. Although no one else might know it, they would know it themselves, and this would destroy their self-respect. Those who are not conscientious and faithful in little things would not be reformed were their laws and restrictions and penalties upon the point. So God's faithful children need no locks and keys because every act of their lives is in harmony with God's principles and the standards that derive from the principles, they are faithful to the standards as well. May God bless us and help us to be this kind of person that we've spoken about this afternoon.